Hi, everyone. Um, it's morning here in Arizona, so I'll say good morning. And um, I'd like to, first of all, uh, say my name, which is Stephanie Forrest, and um, thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk today. I uh, decided to talk about some a topic that I'm personally very interested in that I think is super important and that I think the GI field is well positioned to make contributions to helping us think about. And that is how engineering and evolution interact and in particular, why, uh, how they interact in software and why software is a great place to think about it. I should mention that I'm at Arizona State University and um, I direct a center at the Biodesign Institute. I'm also a tenured um, professor in what is now called or about to be called the School of Computing and Augmented Intelligence. So let's get started. Um, let me give you, first of all, a quick overview of what I hope to cover. Uh, these are the main points. Some of them I'll spend more time on than others. Um, but my big message is, first of all, that software is engineered and evolved. And uh, to understand what that means, I think we need to think about what happens at the macro level that is to our whole software infrastructure over time and at the micro level, um, which is where most genetic improvement methods live. That is um, evolution in, a, in an individual uh, program or module. I also wanna say that uh, genetic improvement as it, is in, as it is practiced today, in my mind is um, not leveraging um, all the power of evolutionary computation. And so I think I have a few ideas about what's missing. You may have others, but I think we should think about that. And also that evolutionary computation itself is um, still uh, kind of a pale imitation of, of natural evolution. And so we may actually need to look to biology to get our GI systems um, you know, uh, running at, uh, at the next level um, and tackling bigger, harder problems. And in the future, I think the future um, for engineering generally and software in particular is going to involve leveraging the interactions between evolution and engineering. And I think we and GI could maybe help, um, help everyone think about how to get there. So I wanna start my remarks by um, reminding you of a paper that a famous French biologist, Francois, Jacob wrote, um, I don't know, roughly 50 years ago, in which he argued that nature is a tinkerer and not an inventor. And um, in the paper, he talks about the tinkerer and the craftsman. I'm <clears throat> using engineering to kind of cover the craftsman idea. And, um, and anyway, he, he really highlighted the differences between, he laid out some properties of um, what I'll call engineering. I think none of them seem particularly controversial to us. And he contrasted them with properties of evolution. So for example, he argued that engineering is an, or craftsmanship is a planned enterprise with specifications or blueprints, while evolution is unplanned and open-ended. He argued that, um, I'm just going to use engineering because it's easier for me to say. Engineering is uh, goal-driven and has objectives, whereas evolution isn't headed in any particular direction, but is just focused on survival um, and, and reproduction and relative fitness. He argued that um, because of this, um, object, this objective-driven um, uh, aspect of engineering that, that we we could start with clean slate designs. I think that's probably less true now, certainly in software. And that evolution on the other hand was an ongoing process. It didn't get to go back and start at ground zero, but had to work with the, um, the elements that it had in front of it. And similarly, because, because of this clean slate design, uh, he argued that craftsmen could make large conceptual jumps, whereas evolution had to be incremental because it's driven, uh, driven by random mutation rather than conducted by agents who have foresight and intent. And I think, I think this actually summarizes how many people think today, um, but I have come to believe that um, 
Jacob is wrong and that uh, there is not such a sharp distinction between these two processes. And so I want to, I want to um, illustrate my points with some examples. First of all, I'm going to consider some examples that were clearly designed by, uh, by evolution or by uh, human, human ingenuity. And I want to observe that it's, it's remarkable, to me it's remarkable, that such different design processes can produce relatively similar structures. And maybe you don't think this termite mound um, that was built by completely distributed agents and regulates its temperature inside, um, inside the nest and controls humidity and even regulates uh, gas concentrations. You might not think that that's um, exactly similar to this cathedral, but um, to me, they, they sort of have a similar, a similar shape and our next example will be more like that. Um, however, it's really not so remarkable because um, we as human craftsmen mimic nature all the time as Gaudi did um, in this famous cathedral. Another example um, where we have two different design processes producing um, structures that are similar in function and in some cases uh, similar looking is uh, the lens. So we have the lens of an eagle's eye um, contrasted with the lens, um, a Nikon lens in a camera. And um, again, you know, I think we got some of our ideas about um, building lenses and cameras from from the fact that natural systems have vision. So there's lots of examples of that. I just picked out two. I now want to highlight uh, some examples where evolution and engineering are, are sort of um, hybridized to produce new kinds of processes. And so my first example is um, one of my favorites. This is uh, Francis Arnold shown here in the picture who won a Nobel Prize in 2018 for pioneering the field of directed evolution. And I'm extremely, I was extremely excited when I found out she got the Nobel Prize because directed evolution is basically a genetic algorithm implemented in chemistry. And so uh, what they do is they start with uh, naturally evolved um, individuals uh, d pieces of DNA, they induce um, mutations. I mean, I think they up the mutation rate, but the mutations occur spontaneously. Um, and then, so that's sort of the evolution natural part. Then they um, use an engineered screening system to do fitness evaluation in the form of chemical assays that test um, test the individuals for whatever property they're trying to evolve for. In this case, um, high fluorescence. And then um, after, after the screening, they then uh, use selection to amplify the most fit of the individuals according to their criterion, and then they repeat the cycle. So that, um, that I think is a beautiful example of sort of a hybrid between evolution and engineering. Um, this is an example that probably uh, almost certainly won't win a Nobel Prize because it is a major, major health problem. And that's uh, the phenomenon of antibio excuse me, antibiotic resistance. And so here we've got the, uh, the craftsmen who produce um, new drugs and release them into the wild when they're used to treat someone with a microbial infection. And if you treat enough people with the same uh, antibiotic for long enough, eventually um, evolution finds a way to um, evolve, e evolve microbes that can resist the drug. And we see a similar phenomenon in, in cancer treatment. And so then that leads to, of course, um, the need to engineer more drugs, et cetera, et cetera. And the problem here, uh, this is highly simplified, but the problem here is that the uh, left part of this cycle, the natural evolution part, seems to run a lot faster and cost less money than the right-hand part of the curve, which is the coming up with new drugs. A final example of um, 
these sort of hybrid engineered evolved systems are um, what are being called xenobots. And um, this is work that was published last year in the PNAS by Mike Levin's group at Tufts. And for those of you who don't know him, uh, if you have any interest in sort of how biology and engineering and computation fit together, you should go look at some of the things he's done. I think it's, it's a really, really interesting person who's done some very interesting projects. Anyway, this particular project, which he did with uh, Josh Bongard and, and several others, took naturally evolved cells uh, from the frog and used them to build a, a robot that, um, that could move towards, uh, move towards a target, uh, collect a payload, and then potentially move to another place to deliver the payload. And these are very small. These are like on the order of a millimeter. And I think the idea is that they might be used to um, develop medicine or uh, to deliver drugs. So the payload would be some medicine. And um, what they did, in, uh, I'm, I'm like way simplified flying, you should go read the paper, but roughly the green cells here, they, they designed the thing in using a simulator that's shown in the middle and the green cells are um, sort of passive cells and the red cells are contracting cells. And they came up with a design that was roughly just those two kinds of uh, functions that allowed the collective to, um, to behave in the way they wanted. Okay, so those are some hybrids. And I guess I think our future um, is going to be uh, more and more hybrids like that. There's plenty of other examples. Uh, but I also want to just highlight some ambiguities that I think really um, call into question this uh, dichotomy between engineering and evolution. And if we use the criteria that Jacob pointed to, um, one thing that kind of violates that idea are Rich Lenski's experiments um, on bacteria. He's a, a well-known evolutionary biologist um, at Michigan State University. And he observed, he has studied um, in the lab populations of bacteria evolving over many years. It's several decades now. And in some cases, he's observed that these bacteria very suddenly switch from the ability to metabolize one kind of sugar to the ability to metabolize another kind of sugar. And it is truly a large jump, even though it uh, requires a significant uh, change in the metabolic processing of the, of the um, cell. Um, another example of a large jump in evolution is, is the reassortment process in influ influenza. This is what can happen, for example, when uh, a a bird virus and a pig virus interact in the same animal and reassort and and um, produce a new a new variant um, or strain and those are lots of times the precipitating causes of, of flu epidemics. Um, in a different vein, the uh, many people now view the process of innovation. So this is on the on the engineering side. Um, as a process that looks a lot like evolution. And in particular, people now can have measured uh, quantitatively and argued um, less quantitatively that almost all technological progress is driven by recombination of earlier ideas. And so that, um, I think we all know this in software, but that really violates this idea of clean slate uh, design as a, as a key key aspect of engineering. And then in software, as I will argue, I think we have lots of examples of how randomized systems, um, uh, of, of how randomized kind of mutation driven, undirected processes are being used um, actively as part of engineering. And so um, attack fuzzing is a great example. Chaos engineering is a great example. And I think, um, People actively, you know, people talk all the time about arms races and cyber cybersecurity, and they they really uh, are like co-evolutionary arms races. Okay, and there's there's plenty of other examples, but all of this um, sort of leads me to ask the question: If I give you two 
two artifacts um, how and tell you nothing about them, how would you decide whether or not it had been produced by evolution or by engineering? And so this is sort of a, you know, a twist on the famous Turing test. I'm going to ca call it the Jacob test. And um, it's really, to me at least, very unclear what criteria we should use. I mean, you can think about things like minimal design. Um, I, don't, I don't know what else, uh, maybe robustness you might put on the nature side. I'm not sure. And, um, and I think increasingly our engineered artifacts are, it's, it's, it's hard to point to what we think is really different. And so maybe in the discussion, if I keep moving on my slides, uh, maybe we'll have time to get some of your ideas about that. But in, you know, kind of to wrap up this part of the talk, I think nature is not always a tinkerer. And, um, but even more so, I think engineered artifacts are not produced only through craftsmanship. And it's really that second part of the message that I think is most relevant for us. So now what I wanna do is talk about um, how, what that looks like in software. And so, excuse me. I think most, oh, let me just check my time. I don't have a clock here. This is very um, annoying. Okay, I think I'm doing well. Okay, so um, most of us, I think, well know very well that the key ingredients of Darwinian evolution are uh, variation, competition and natural selection, and inheritance of variations. And um, some authors now argue um, drift as a fourth mechanism. But I think in the standard view, these are the three main um, driving mechanisms. And so we see, uh, we see all these things in software, right? Every time we copy a piece of code or a library or a package or even an entire executable, we are in some sense performing selection. And of course the code uh, is getting passed down. So it's being inherited, whatever the changes were in that particular version. And we have variation, which we get uh, by people making small changes and ideally someday by genetic improvement systems making small changes automatically and, um, and recombining successful um, modules or uh, functions or libraries, kind of mixing and matching um, as we go. And so my hypothesis is, and I'm sorry to say I've had this hypothesis for quite a while, some of you may have heard me talk about it before. My hypothesis is that software today is shaped by many generations of inadvertent evolution. And I would like to be able to confirm or deny that hypothesis, um, but I've, I've found it harder and harder to do that, which is sort of what's led me to think about all these things. However, um, I will say that in the decades since we first um, started building these uh, genetic improvement systems for software, I think software has only become more biological and we have even more um, kind of driving mechanisms that are um, evolutionary in nature. And so we have things like stack overflow, which is kind of the canonical uh, copy and inherit mechanism for uh, little code snippets or genes. We have um, uh, A-B testing that's used widely to design and experiment with uh, web interfaces. And uh, interestingly, uh, many, many of these um, A-B systems are being run by genetic algorithms in the background. So the idea is that uh, the genetic algorithm uh, generates a random, randomized um, version of, of a web interface and then uh, we, the users of it, are providing, they collect data on how many clicks we make and how long it takes us to get to the purchase now button, for example. And then they take that information and use that to generate a new, a new set of variations on the, on the website. There's also um, the continuous integration uh, paradigms in software development, which have become um, very popular. And I just want to give a shout out to the Reparinator uh, project, which 
um, sort of insert, try to insert GI into this DevOps cycle. Um, I actually think that's a great, uh, architecturally, a great way for GI to make its way into the world. And um, hopefully someday we'll have a little GI uh, piece over here in the blue. But that's a much more continuous, incremental, evolutionary, uh, make a random, you know, make, make a, a test random or not, and a small change and see if it works approach to software development. And that's certainly different than the models that we used to have, which were much more uh, write down the specification, write the thing from scratch, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, fuzzing we've talked about. Um, the idea of engineers just uh, making uh, random inputs to code and using that instead of trying to figure out what, uh, what they should be testing or um, how they should be thinking about their code. I think that's uh, well accepted now. Uh, chaos engineering is a thing and, and it has a, a, a whole set of relatives. And that's essentially using these ideas of random changes um, on large distributed um, online systems to try to understand um, what their failure modes are and to make them more resilient. And then um, in the cybersecurity world, which I spend a lot of time thinking about, we definitely have these arms races. Uh, Two-factor authentication, I think, is a recent, um, a recent step in that arms race. And of course, as soon as two-factor authentication got rolled out uh, widely, um, it didn't take long for uh, there to be attacks against it. And Uber, Uber was an early victim of that. Okay, um, so these are all things to, that indicators to me that point to evolutionary forces in software. But what I think is harder to answer, and this is a little version, another version of this Jacob test, can we actually see measurable effects of this kind of macro level evolution in software? And, um, in particular, what, what should we be looking for? What should we measure? What should we be looking for? And so this is a little bit of a story of uh, the past few years of my life. Um, those kinds of questions led me to ask what it is that people in evolutionary biology look for as hallmarks of evolved systems. And I recently uh, recently wrote a paper with Risto McCulicanen um, that asks this question with respect to evolutionary computation. And there we identified uh, these, I don't know, six or seven different, um, I think we call them characteristics. Hallmarks might be a little overstating, but you know, hallmarks, like what, what are the kinds of things you would expect to see in a naturally evolving system? And I don't have time to go through all of these or tell you how I think they do or do not fit in with software and genetic improvement, but the, I do have time. I'll tell you about two that I've looked at in my own work, which is neutrality and epistasis. So let me just tell you quickly about that. This is the uh, relentless self-promotion part of the talk where I tell you some of my own research. And um, so the first one is actually older work. You may, may have known about it. We've published it quite a while ago. Um, other people don't seem to be as much in love with it as I am, so I'm going to take the liberty of retelling it again. But uh, it is known in biology that many mutations leave fitness unchanged. And there's a variety of different, in some cases, competing explanations for why that's true. But it is well known to be true, and most evolutionary biologists believe that um, this so-called mutational robustness is um, a key enabler of evolution. That is, we would not have systems that were evolvable if we didn't have this kind of mutational robustness property. So we several years ago set out to measure this in software and defined a neutral mutation 
there are now some other words in the literature that mean the same thing. Um, but we will use the term neutral primarily. Um, a neutral mutation is one that is test suite equivalent. That is, if you've got a test suite, um, you've got a program and you've got a test suite, the, um, and you make a mutation to the program, it still passes the original test suite. So that's, we're gonna call those mutations neutral, or if we're being really careful, neutral with respect to the test suite. In the context of bug repair, you know, these neutral mutations might or might not repair the bug, but what we were interested in is just how much, how much of this mutational robustness is there. And it turned out there's a lot, much more than I would have expected. I still find this really remarkable that um, even if we do the mutations only to regions of the code that are being tested by the test cases, still roughly a third of the time, um, the mutations we were working with at the time um, are neutral. And this work has been um, <clears throat> semi-independently -independ was, was uh, looked at in Java by the group in, uh, that was in France and now in Sweden. And they, um, they got similar results. It took a while. I met with uh, Benoit Baudry at one point, and it seemed like we had really different percentages. But when we um, worked through what we were actually measuring and how we were measuring it, it turned out that our numbers, um, our results were really very consistent. And this is just an example uh, from a quick sort of like how you might get a neutral mutation. Okay, so that's known. Um, I still think it's really interesting and important. Um, and one thing that I think is interesting is where is the question of where it comes from. <laughs> and so we've considered many answers. Um, but I haven't figured out good ways to measure them um, or tease them apart. But there's one family of answers that is essentially sloppy programming. So it might be, uh, you know, I think people, lots of people think it's poor testing, poor test cases. I am quite convinced that's, uh, <clears throat> that, that might change the, the percentages a little bit, but that's not the driving thing. It could be, Software just has a lot of unnecessary redundancies in it that have just sort of crept in over time. Um, there could be neglected shortcuts or optimizations, or or the, these, this redundancy could have been put in there on purpose as a form of defensive programming. And there's probably some other explanations that fall under that category. Um, it's also true, as in the case of that quick sort example that I gave you, that for any particular program specification, there are infinitely many programs that could implement it. So um, <clears throat> in some ways, it's not so surprising that there's lots of different programs that need a specification. The fact that, um, that you can get to those programs just by random mutation is, um, is to me a little more surprising. There could, it could be that it, this is a psychological, largely a psychological phenomenon that human pro, you know, hum, the people who write programs are humans. And in order for them to com comprehend what they're writing and understand it, or for other people to read it, that, um, that a lot of this redundancy is needed just, just sort of for the, the program to human part of the interface rather than the program to machine part of the interface. Um, it could be an artifact of the programming languages we have. Um, that's certainly possible, although we think the phenomenon cuts across um, uh, the com common programming languages. And of course, there's my favorite solution, uh, my favorite explanation, which is it was produced by evolution. But this is why I have a hypothesis and I don't have like a confirmed hypothesis because I don't know really how to distinguish this uh, produced by evolution cause from all the earlier ones. Okay. So what we've been talking about with mutational robustness, if you look at this black dot here, and I hope you can see my cursor, um, what, we, what those experiments did was really in concept, take a, make, for example, a thousand copies of a program and apply a single randomized mutation to each copy. And so um, in this graph, each, each uh, node is a program and two programs are connected by an edge if there's a neutral mutation 
that that um, applied to one version of the program gives you another version. And so what we started doing, this was, a, this was inspired by um, my many interactions with theoretical biologists over the years. Um, what we started do, what we did was we started with the original program and instead of just going one edit away in mutation space, we started going, I think as many as 10 edits away and exploring what, um, what is often referred to as a neutral, the neutral landscape. And so this is work that actually uh, Joe Renzullo um, published um, a few years ago at a GI workshop. So it should look familiar to you. And um, in this example, the colored, uh, the colored nodes represent um, inadvertent repairs to, late, to a latent bug. That is a bug that wasn't being tested in the test, in the test suite. And the colors indicate um, different kinds of repairs, that is repairs to different lines of code in the program. And this really, uh, this result, I mean, we have these similar, I, I picked out this one because it, uh, it was an echo of an earlier GI workshop paper, but um, just checking my time. Give me a minute here. Uh, okay, I gotta speed up. Um, Anyway, this led us to really uh, to, to think that if, if the repairs are often this far away in mutation space, um, that really what we should be doing is trying to look a little more broadly and, and get our search processes to move further away from the original program. And so now I'm gonna speed up. Um, that led us to ask uh, where the repairs might be in neutral space. And it also led us to an insight, which is totally obvious in retrospect, and maybe it's obvious to all of you, but I had not thought of it, that, uh, that in fact, any mutation or set of mutations that is a repair um, to a bug must by definition be neutral. That is, it must by definition also pass the original test case, test suite. And so what we did was generate a large pool of single edit neutral mutations, like 10,000 of them. And then we started asking, pulling them out uh, in random, uh, sampling randomly, but in groups ranging from one up to 300. So over here, we were taking our pool of 10,000 neutral mutations and pulling out 300 of them randomly and applying them all to the same program and then asking, how many of them, how many of those, uh, I mean, we take the 300, but we, then we do that sampling of 300 multiple times. And we say, how many of those samples of 300 actually uh, repair the bug? And what we found were, were, were these distinctive curves. We've confirmed this in many different programs now, wh where there is a peak that is a significant distance away from um, just one mutation at a time. And so we think that one way to improve automated repair is to get our algorithms looking around the peak, that is where there's light, more likely to be repairs in this large neutral space than so close to the original program. Um, we think we understand why the curve is shaped this way, but what we don't understand is why for every program in bug scenario, the peak occurs at a different location and has a different height. So that's, um, that's work in progress, but um, these results, if you're interested, were published recently um, at IPDPS. And, um, and the big news is that you do a lot better uh, if you move quite a distance away from the original program. Okay, so that's, um, that's a story about new, new, neutra neutrality and why I think it's relevant. I'm just gonna breeze through this quickly. Um, about epistasis. These are recent results that have not been published, but they are based on work that um, my student Jerry Liu uh, presented at a GI workshop, I don't know, a year or two ago. I don't remember exactly when, maybe two years ago. We have recently, so, so this is his system, he calls it GIVO, and what we use it for is evolving the LLVM intermediate representation um, of programs that run on GPUs. And so this is just a little map of how that works. Um, recently, we've been looking at multiple sequence alignment programs and collaborating with a group from Lawrence Berkeley Labs 
Um, they have a highly optimized, hand-tuned for, for a particular GPU version of um, the Smith-Waterman algorithm, which is used, um, is the most common approach to doing multiple sequence alignment. And this is a picture of the multiple sequence alignment problem, which I'm not going to take time to explain. Anyway, we did a run. They, they came to us with this and said, <clears throat> okay, hot shots, here, here's the best that we could do. <clears throat> Can your evolving system do any better? So we did a run, 256 individuals, uh, 300 generations, and found a version of the program that is um, runs 28.5% faster than the original, which is a huge improvement on an already optimized um, code that runs in the inner loop. And interestingly, um, that program has, it has a lot of mutations. 17 of them are really uh, the important ones. And of the 17, 12 of them are highly epistatic. And um, we're having a lot of struggles trying to understand how they work. I actually think the 12 break into some subgroups, but um, there's clearly a huge amount of epistasis in these solutions. And the whiz kid who did the hand tuning of the algorithm uh, for the GPU He's been working with us to help us understand um, what these mutations are actually doing, and some of them are uh, some of them are things, for example, that the CUDA programming manual tells you not to do. Uh, there's all kinds of interesting things, but the algorithm, the program, still gives uh, uh, the same uh, correctness uh, answers as the original, and so <clears throat> I'm really excited about this because I. This shows a lot of evolution. And um, also because I, th I think it's, it's a good place for genetic improvement because these epistatic mutations, I think are not only hard for us to understand, they're hard for humans to think up in the first place. And so this is a place where we can really, um, really make a difference. Okay, so let me uh, just check my time again. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna try to wrap up so we can have some discussion. Uh, this is the pontific. We've now left the relentless self-promotion part of the talk, and we're into the pontificating part of the talk. And so, this is my summary of where we are today. Most of us are doing um, stochastic search of the space of possible program edits. Um, and what I've observed in the papers that um, that I see published and the ones that I review is that there's increasing emphasis on um, better mutation, uh, more intelligent, um, templated and targeted mutation operators. So the ways in which we change the code, I think we're putting a lot of effort into thinking about how we do that. But there's been, as far as I can see, very little attention paid to um, the search part of the equation. That's the part, that's the way in which I think GI is not leveraging all of evolutionary computation and recombination or crossover, and then drift, um, which is something I've uh, been thinking about a lot um, every time I talk to an evolutionary biologist. Um, we also, as I've mentioned, have these very conservative search strategies. So that's one reason I think we need to be thinking about search. Um, there are some new ideas in the evolutionary computation uh, community about that. Novelty search is an example. And then um, for program repair, of course, the vast majority of our repairs, um, with a few exceptions, are still single edits. So we're not really, really leveraging epistasis so much. Um, these are my hopes for genetic improvement for tomorrow, or for the future. Um, the first would be using um, using genetic improvement to solve more complex problems. And I think all of us would like to do that. I think that's why we're here and why we're working on the field. And to do that, I think requires incorporating more evolutionary computation, more, more of the real biology. Um, I'm thinking more, much more deeply about neutrality and drift is my place to start, but there's lots of other uh, untapped uh, regions of the space out there. And then, Importantly, I think we should be asking ourselves, 
what we would do if we had as many computational resources as the machine learning people have for training their models. And uh, I would like us to think about how we could use those resources most effectively and how we would redesign our methods um, so that we could take advantage of them. And, and I'll just note that a huge amount of the recent success in machine learning has simply come from throwing just astronomical amounts of computing power at these, at these training algorithms. And so I don't see why um, that shouldn't happen for evolution. And I, but I think we, we should be um, thinking, thinking big and thinking about uh, what changes that means for, for our, our field. Um, and speaking of machine learning, um, is machine learning gonna put us out of business? So there's a way in which, uh, you know, a program is just a mapping from inputs to outputs, and that's all a neural net is. So um, maybe all of programming and software engineering and high level languages will just go away and all, all we will ever have is neural nets. Um, that's a possibility and we're certainly seeing lots more machine learning in software engineering. But um, I actually think um, that that's not going to happen and that uh, we need evolution um, for a variety of reasons. And even the neural nets community, the deep learning community has discovered uh, using neuroevolution for um, designing these big deep learning architectures. And that's a form of, of modularity, right? That, that um, these big deep learning systems aren't just one undifferentiated gigantic matrix, but they're a whole series of little neural nets that are sort of wired together in different ways. And, um, and I think that's the kind of modularity that, that evolution is better at discovering than, um, than standard machine learning. And then of course, um, I also would like us to really be thinking big about um, how, how evolutionary processes, whether inadvertent or intentional, like the genetic improvement, um, how those interact with, in, with engineering dynamics in software. I also think um, there's some evolutionary um, implications for software. Um, and so I'm just gonna mention three, I guess, quickly. Uh, one, and, and I'll spend the most time on this one because I, I think it's really interesting. Both Steve Frank and Mike Lynch, who are both eminent um, evolutionary thinkers, have, um, have talked about this. And it's a kind of ratchet, although that's, I, that's a bit of an abusive terminology in the evolutionary biology world. So don't, don't use it outside of this community. Um, but the story goes like this, that evolution uh, from time to time is good at, at increasing the robustness of a system. And it, has, and it does that by discovering sort of meta control systems. So they might be repair mecha mechanisms for detecting and repairing um, DNA errors. Um, they might be homeostatic mechanisms. They might be um, the mechanisms inside a cell that, that help, um, help cells avoid becoming cancerous. Um, but every time these robustness mechanisms are discovered, and there's a lot of them in biology, um, they come with a cost, right? It's a resource cost uh, to maintain the, 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 the mechanism. And importantly, they also reduce the selective pressure on the underlying components. So if you have a repair system, you know, like it's like typing, right? If you've got um, an a spelling correction thing running in the background, automatically correcting your typing as you go, you become, as I have, a much sloppier typist. And so what happens after a while is um, that the, there, there's less selective pressure on those underlying components. And so they degrade. And that means that over time, you can't go back. You can't get rid of the robustness mechanism because the components underneath have, have um, lost lost their ability to um, maintain themselves. And so that puts in a, a form of directionality to evolution 
and uh, because of the cost of these robustness mechanisms over time leads to um, you know, an overall reduction of average fitness in some cases. And I think we have this in spades in IT systems uh, today. And um, I would love to figure out the experiment where I could actually measure that. Okay, there's also um, a thing called highly optimized tolerance, which is um, sort of highlights the trade-off between optimizing uh, for performance in certain dimensions and leaving yourself vulnerable to major uh, catastrophes or perturbations in other, other uh, dimensions. I think we've seen that recently with um, adversarial examples that showed up in machine learning systems that were overly optimized for a particular data set. And then um, as our programmed agents go out into the world, um, we're gonna have interactions between the physical world and uh, our engineered things, like I've shown here with this little helicopter and real adaptive agents. And so I think these hybrids and these sort of unintended consequences like antibiotic resistance um, are going to uh, become more prevalent. Okay, so I'm gonna leave you with uh, my questions and I hope you as a community will help me answer them. Uh, how to distinguish between engineered and evolved systems. What, um, what are the effects of macro evolution and software? Like, you know, can we actually establish that this is happening in some way that would be convincing? Um, and just even a little closer to home, why is there so much mutational robustness in software? Um, I think for genetic improvement, we need to think much more seriously about search spaces. I've talked about that. And then I, I, would, I think we as a field are really well positioned to develop and lead the way of thinking about best practices for combining evolution and engineering, um, first in software, but more generally for all, all of engineering. And so I will close um, with uh, some quotations from another scientist who I admire greatly, Jack Shostak. He's at Harvard University and he says, never do something that a thousand other people are doing. So even though our field is relatively small compared to some of the other fields, I think that's a good thing. And I would like to uh, encourage all of you to continue asking big questions. So thank you very much. Um, I don't know what I'm supposed to do now that my talk is over. Do I stop? What we're going to do now is uh, people can ask questions in the chat and I'll read them out to you. And hopefully we can get a little bit of discussion going. OK, can I stop sharing? Uh, yes, you can stop sharing. OK. Great. So, well, uh, I, can see, I can see one person at least. <laughs> yeah, you were. You don't. Uh, and now people are giving you virtual claps. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so yes, please uh, ask questions in the chat, and I'll try to read them out to you, uh, and we can discuss them. So, Myra Cohen is asking: Epistasis appears to be very powerful, but edits far away from the original program may conflict, making patches humanly readable. Sorry, uh, humanly readable and hence accepted by the community. It may also make validating the correctness difficult. We know we can have talent. We 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 know we have the talent, uh, t talent to hard to ha hard to detect faults that even good test suites may may not detect. This may mean we need to evolve stronger test suites, along with larger edits. Can you discuss the trade-offs? That's a big. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. So. Um, sure. I think, um, I think better, bigger, more, uh, test cases, as long as we can run them relatively, um, efficiently or have a way of sampling them is a good idea. Um, I'm going to say the least controversial things first, and then I'll end up with the most provocative. Okay. And so the next, uh, least controversial thing is that we and quite a few others people are now starting to do work with um, using invariance, um, automatic invariant detection to characterize um, um, candidate repairs and, and evaluate them. And I think that's actually quite promising in terms of being able to supplement our test cases. Um, but I have to say, I don't worry about overfitting to test cases as much as everyone else does. And most controversially, I don't worry about readability because 
uh, no one is really, I mean, they're only now starting to, to ask questions about explainability of neural networks. And so I think, um, uh, you know, in a way, I, I mean, our, our, it, I don't understand how, the, how my browser works. I think most of us don't. And so I, I think this, uh, this idea of interpretability and readability is, um, uh, should not get in the way of us developing powerful evolutionary methods. Um, but I do think there's some things we could do along the way to help it. And, and um, as I mentioned, I think evolution is better at finding modules and having definable units than uh, subunits that would be more comprehensible than, um, than the way machine learning works today. But yeah, those are all fair points, Myra. Okay, uh, I'll go to G uh, Giovanni Giesel's question. Uh, I, got quite, I got curious from incorporating more biology in GI. Is there anything that you personally would like to see from, from, from biology inside computation? Well, the one that I, um, the, my personal first candidate is, uh, I guess one thing I would say is, is this paper that we published um, in Nature Machine Intelligence um, sort of is my best crack at that. Um, but it's by no means the last word. And out of those things that I listed on that slide, the hallmarks, um, I think thinking much more seriously about drift and much more seriously about selective pressure is um, kind of tops of my list. And I think part of why that's true is I think that might have impact on how we answer the question of what to do if we scale up in a big way. You know, when we get, I mean, these, I heard a great statistic not too long ago that the amount of energy it takes to train a single language model in machine learning is equivalent to the energy consumption lifetime energy consumption of five automobiles. That's, uh, that's including all the manufacturing and all the fossil fuels that you use when you drive it and probably lots of other things I haven't thought about. So, you know, if we could have that much energy to spend on a run, what would we do? And, you know, we might have less selective pressure, we might search more broadly, we might tolerate more drift in our populations, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, uh, thanks for that. Uh, Wes Weimer asks, for, for some of the things you uh, talk about, better search, multiple edits, coevolution, in many cases, we, uh, we may not be aware of those more nuanced way to do things. And you're, telling this, I mean, you're telling us about them now, thanks. But it may also be pragmatic, be, it will almost be that prag, pragmatic concerns like long fitness evaluation times for software make them look less attractive are, are there solutions or analogs on the bio side for dealing with these costs, e.g. a first stepping stone to for, for those on the CS side? Um, well, that's a really good point. I think the thing that's hard in our field, uh, the, the biggest thing that's different between what we do and what the rest of evolutionary computation does um, is that we start with a program that's almost working, right? It's 100% correct, except roughly, except for it has one defect. And that is actually, that's what allowed our field to get going, that insight that you didn't have to do what genetic programming typically did, which is start with completely random programs, is what let us be successful. But because of that, we've ended up being very conservative in terms of how we do our searches. And so, um, I think the cost of evaluating test, test suites, I don't worry about so much because A, I think we deserve as much computational resource as uh, machine learning does. <laughs> and um, B, there's a lot of sampling methods and shortcuts that you could imagine devising. Um, but I do think the question of how, how to get our systems to search more broadly uh, at the same time that we preserve the functionality that we care about, that really puts us much closer to biological evolution than, than to evolutionary computation. And that's one reason I think we should be thinking more broadly about biology. 
Okay, uh, this is a question that I actually wanted to ask as well, and I suppose it's quite broad, and this is from uh, Alexandra Bergel. Uh, how do we make good on the neutral mu mutual mutation? And he, go and he goes on, when I apply GI, I usually avoid doing, do, doing, mu mu doing mutations that decrease the fitness or leave it unchanged. From your talk, you said that neutrals are, are important, but I'm unsure how to make good use of it. Ah, well, okay. The relentless self-promotion answer is uh, look at our paper in IPDPS where we uh, design an algorithm. It's not very, it, it, it's, um, it's a multiplicative weights update algorithm rather than a, a, a true genetic algorithm, but it leverages these neutral mutations. Um, that's one answer. The other answer, and I actually I'm really grateful for this question because um, not only do we not tolerate neutral mutations, we, we also don't tolerate uh, slightly deleterious mutations. And there's a thing in, in evolution known as compensatory evolution, where you sort of uh, uh, systems have sort of decreases, minor decreases in fitness that then lead to big jumps forward in the future. And so I, I think, I, you know, roughly the answer to that is less selective pressure, bigger populations, um, and figuring out how all that works, um, and taking the theory that has been developed by population biology, um, population geneticists, and um, un really understanding how it applies to, uh, to our systems is uh, important work and it's not as obvious as it should be, <laughs> to me at least. That's, yeah, that's a good answer. I also really liked your uh, whole thing that we should just use more computing power on these things. And that seems to be a lot of, uh, solves a lot of problems as well, or could do. Well, it's just, I mean, it's just gonna reshape what we care about. Yeah. And, um, you know, these learning, these machine learning algorithms haven't changed in, 30 years or something, really. So uh, Oliver asks, is software really, really mutually ro mutually robust or or is it that, that these operators we, we use are just designed this way to avoid breaking the code intentionally or otherwise? Ah, uh, mutationally robust. Yes. Yes, the amount of mutational robustness certainly depends on uh, the kind of mutation that we do. Um, I will just point out that most of us are still using copy, delete, and some form of swap or move, but copy and delete for sure. And um, those mutation operators were based on operation, edit operations that people do. Uh, but that is, I, you know, I will say that's, that's another thing that strikes me about our field is that people we're still using those same basic paradigms and then just changing what gets copied, what gets deleted, what gets moved. And there might be, you know, other, other possible c classes of mutations that, that we could think about. Thank you. Uh, we've got 90 seconds left. Uh, <laughs> I think we've answered all the questions. So uh, I'll thank you on behalf of the whole audience. Uh, thank you very much for uh, giving your talk today. And uh, thank you very much for the Q and A. And I think this went. I think this all went broadcast well. I didn't hear any problems, so that's fantastic. Uh, do you have any final comments or? Well, I just. I first of all want to thank the audience for these great questions. I'm sorry I couldn't see the chat. So if any of you um, wrote other questions into the chat or or comments to me um, directly. If you could just please uh, send them to me by email, or I, I will be lurking around um, for most of the rest of the workshop. But um, I feel really uh, blind without having the chat available. And I don't yeah. know why I didn't find it here, but it, I didn't. Anyway, but thank you, everybody. It was, it was a lot of fun. And um, it was a lot harder for me to pull this together than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I suppose just since I have the audience, uh, we're going to take a 20 minute break now, and then it's going to be the first paper session, uh, depending on your time zone, but it's 5.25 uh, p.m. in UTC time, and I'll let you guys convert that for yourself. 
and we've got some interesting papers coming up and I look forward to seeing you there. Different format, it's gonna be uh, the recorded talks and then Q&A. So see you soon. Okay, thank you.